You are probably aware of the damage invasive species can do to an ecosystem, but what you may not know is that non-native species can actually help restore ecosystems and increase biodiversity. Let's take a look at just two famous projects where this occurred. First up, we'll head to the island nation of Mauritius, once home to the iconic dodo. The dodo has become the symbol for human-caused extinctions. The first European colony was established on Mauritius in the year 1638, and the poor dodo didn't last long. It's believed that it was wiped out entirely in less than 30 years. What most people aren't aware of is that Mauritius also lost 77 other species since the first colony was established, many of which can be found nowhere else in the world, including two species of giant tortoise, one being a browser, meaning it mainly ate woody vegetation, and the other being a grazer. The tortoises were the largest herbivores in Mauritius, and as such were the main drivers of the ecosystem there. But sadly, like the dodo, they too were wiped out by Europeans in the 1600s. Europeans hunted the tortoises for food, they cleared large areas of habitat for agriculture, and they also introduced cats, rats, rabbits and goats, four incredibly common and some of the most damaging invasive species in the world. Together, these animals were doing untold damage on Mauritius. The cats and rats were preying on endemic birds and other small animals. The goats and rabbits were preventing the regrowth of native trees and shrubs, creating an open landscape, making it unsuitable for many of the animals that evolved on Mauritius. In 1984, conservationists set out to tackle the invasive species problem and restore Mauritius to a state not seen since the 1600s. Rather than tackle the main island first, they decided to start with two small offshore islands. Round Island and Ilo Egret, and turned these into safe havens for the wildlife of Mauritius. They successfully removed the goats, rabbits, rats and cats by the late 90s, an incredible achievement. This caused an unforeseen problem though. Without the grazing and browsing of goats and rabbits, invasive plant species grew rampant, shading out endemic native plants. It was also noticed that many native plants needed herbivores to survive. Some had evolved the need to be trampled, others to be grazed, or the need for large seed dispersing herbivores. They couldn't introduce any herbivore they wanted though, as they saw with the rabbits and goats. Mauritius needed the right herbivores, something that behaved like the giant tortoises that once lived there. Locally, thanks to none other than Charles Darwin, there were a number of Aldabra giant tortoises in captivity on Mauritius. When Darwin visited the Indian Ocean Islands in the 1800s, he was devastated by the damage that had been done there and the sheer amount of extinctions. He noted that only one island still had its giant tortoise species, Aldabra. Darwin feared that the Aldabra tortoise would be the next extinction, and so he lobbied successfully for some Aldabras to be relocated to Mauritius to breed in captivity and create a security population. These relocated tortoises were kept on large sugar estates in Mauritius, and eventually large herds were established. But unfortunately, by the 1980s when Mauritian conservationists were in need of tortoises, there were very few of these captive Aldabras left. The project had largely been forgotten about, and the tortoises were no longer cared for. Sugar estates aren't exactly a prime habitat for the tortoises, so they weren't doing very well, and had stopped breeding. Nonetheless, the remaining tortoises were recaptured, some of which are believed to have been the original tortoises that were taken from Aldabra decades before. When introduced to the first island, Ilo Egret, these old tortoises thrived and started breeding once again. Not only did the tortoises thrive, but so did the ecosystem and the creatures that lived in it. Invasive plant species were significantly reduced and native plants thrived once more. More than 50 tortoises were being produced each year, all starting from a few old randy tortoises. This allowed the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation to introduce tortoises to two more islands, Round Island and Rodrigues Island, with plans in the future to introduce them to the mainland. This project worked because it was done to benefit ecosystems and incredible research was done before introducing this non-native species. Many people equate any non-native species with being invasive. This in part is because historically, when humans introduced an animal to a non-native land, it wasn't done with ecosystems in mind. Cane toes were introduced to Australia to eat cane beetle grubs, but without any thought to what else they would do in Australian ecosystems. Stoats were introduced to New Zealand to control introduced rabbits, but they didn't think about or seemingly care what stoats would do to the unique bird life of New Zealand. But in Mauritius, before introducing any tortoise, many steps were taken. Firstly, they consulted with experts to see if the Aldabra giant tortoise could replicate the ecosystem functions provided by the two Mauritian giant tortoises, or if they would negatively affect the ecosystem. Secondly, they trialled the introduction in enclosures and also tested a second tortoise species, the radiated tortoise of Madagascar, to see which would be more beneficial. The Aldabran was better able to navigate the rough terrain and so was chosen. 
And lastly, they started on a tiny island. Eloy Great is only 25 hectares or 60 acres, making it easy to remove the tortoises if need be. The Aldabra tortoise is predominantly a grazer, though it does browse more than most tortoises, which made it a great candidate for introduction as it filled the niches of both extinct tortoises to some extent. But conservationists in Mauritius do hope to introduce a browsing tortoise species in the future. Today, there is only one browsing tortoise subspecies that is actively breeding, the Hood Island Giant Tortoise, also known as the Española Island Giant Tortoise. Conservationists working in Mauritius have earmarked it as the best proxy for the saddle-backed Mauritian tortoise, the browsing species, while Aldabra Giant Tortoises would continue as proxy for the domed Mauritian tortoise, the grazer. Neither of these two tortoise species are particularly closely related to the Mauritian giant tortoises. They're about as closely related to one another as cows are to sheep, for example. Separate genera, but the same family. But it's not being closely related that matters. What matters is the role the animals play in an ecosystem, how they interact with the plants and animals around them. The story of Mauritius beautifully shows how the wrong non-native species, in this case goats and rabbits, can be so damaging but the right non-native species can be just the thing that's needed to kick an ecosystem back to life. Now, moving very, very far north for our next example, all the way to Yakutia in northeastern Russia. Most of you watching this video will have heard about Pleistocene Park, one of the world's most famous ecosystem restoration projects. But did you know that at least five of the 10 herbivores that are being used to restore the landscape aren't native? In the late Pleistocene, before humans impacted the ecosystems, Yakutia was home to herds of woolly mammoths, steppe bison, wild horses, reindeer, moose and musk oxen, in densities that rivaled the African Serengeti. In Pleistocene Park today though, alongside the native moose, reindeer, musk oxen and horses, the non-native Bactrian camels, cattle, sheep, goats and American bison are being used. Cattle, sheep and goats are domesticated forms of aurochs, mouflon and bozoar ibex, none of which were ever native to Yakutia. So why are non-native animals being used to restore this ecosystem and why aren't they having negative impacts? To understand, let's see why Pleistocene Park was founded. While researching permafrost in Siberia, Russian geophysicist Sergei Zimov was taken aback by the quantity of bones he was finding as he worked. Thousands of bones belonging to woolly mammoths, steppe bison, cave lions and many others. He became fascinated with the idea that his home was once an arctic savanna, a vast expanse of grasslands, woodlands and shrublands, heaving with large herbivores and the predators that hunted them. His interest and the research he put in made him realise that it was the large herbivores that shaped and maintained these savannas. The grasslands needed the grazing of herbivores and the soil fertility provided through their urine and faeces. Without the herbivores, the soils lost this fertility and the landscape became tundra, a habitat very poor in biodiversity. The revelations kept coming and Zimov realised that the very thing he was studying, the melting of the permafrost, was happening because the landscape lost its herbivores. Let me explain why that is so significant. Permafrost is a layer of frozen soil beneath the active soil layer and it contains vast quantities of carbon and methane, the two most prominent greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Permafrost has been melting at an alarming rate, adding tons of greenhouse gases to our atmosphere. But Zimov realized that the herbivores could actually slow the melting of the permafrost and combat the pace and effects of climate change. The herbivores do this in two ways. Firstly, herbivores can shift the ecosystem from tundra and woodland to grasslands. The grasses are a much lighter colour than the mosses and trees and so reflect much more of the sun's heat, which is very impactful over a large landscape. More importantly though, herbivores crunch the snow beneath their feet and remove it to get to the grasses and herbs they feed on. You may think that snow would make the soil colder, but snow actually acts as a blanket for the soil, insulating the heat the soil acquired from the warmer summer months, which causes a longer period of permafrost thawing. When the herbivores compress and remove the snow though, it allows the freezing winter air to come into contact with the soil, preventing permafrost thaw and even causing more permafrost to form and store carbon and methane. With the knowledge of just how important the herbivores could be in our battle against climate change, Zimov set out to restore the ecosystem that once was. Of course, woolly mammoths and steppe bison aren't alive today, likely two keystone species in Pleistocene Yakutia. So to restore the Arctic savanna, Zimov couldn't rely on native herbivores alone. He needed large herbivores and lots of them. Herbivores that could survive in the freezing Siberian conditions and help restore an ecosystem that hasn't been seen in over 10,000 years. So Zimov and his son Nikita acquired cold adapted herbivores from wherever they could. The herbivores are having the exact impact the Zimovs wanted and have already shifted large areas from dense scrub, poor in soil fertility and biodiversity, 
to grasslands, showing that non-native animals can be a welcome tool in ecosystem restoration as long as research is done and precautions are taken. You may be wondering why I put the word invasive in the title of this video. The non-native animals used in the projects I mentioned are not invasive of course, as they do not damage the ecosystems they've been introduced to. But many people use the word invasive to describe any animal not native to a region. This can actually be quite damaging in terms of conservation and rewilding. Removing a non-native species from a landscape takes a lot of time, effort and money. Not to mention some of the horrible methods that are used to remove non-native species. Many ecologists have expressed the need for assessing a non-native species impact before painting it with the invasive brush, suggesting we should look at whether a species helps increase biodiversity and ecosystem function, or if it is damaging to biodiversity and puts other species at risk of extinction, rather than simply if a species is native or not. This would allow conservationists to prioritize removing truly invasive species and protecting habitats in other more important ways, putting the much needed finances and time to good use. There are many other places in the world where non-native animals benefit ecosystems, such as the weirdly biodiverse Ascension Island, African tortoises in Hawaii, and water buffalo in Coombs Head, England. If you'd like to see a video about more beneficial non-natives, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to help the channel grow. I'd really appreciate the support. Thank you, as always, for watching.